It's my pleasure to introduce our next talk presented by Adobe. And the title of the talk is The Art and Science of Data Collection, Power Growth While Delighting Your Fans. And here to deliver the talk is Jen Zick from Adobe. All right, thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. So again, I'm Jen Zick. I'm uh, with the Digital Strategy Group at Adobe. I've been in the sports and live entertainment industry for about 15 years. I worked for Comcast Spectacor, MLB, more recently Ticketmaster Live Nation. So throughout that process, I've worked with hundreds of sports teams, most of the major leagues, uh, and I'm excited to be here with you today. So let's jump in. All right. So. Um, just a little bit of, of setting the stage here. Um, I think we could all agree across industries, we're seeing more and more that people, consumers, fans, they, they buy experiences, not products. So while the, the product on the court, the field, the win-loss record, I mean, it, it definitely matters. There's a, a more complete um, set of events, uh, services, um, other products, uh, you know, a lot of factors that go into this more complete experience that the fan embodies, that they, um, that they feel, that they remember even after the event ends. So this is something that um, we just need to remember and it's going to anchor the, the topic of conversation today. So as customer experiences accelerate or expectations accelerate, customer experiences need to evolve. So um, customers, fans, they're more and more digital first. They're technology savvy. Technolo technology is changing. There's 5G. There's, there's different offerings out there. Um, so what does that mean? What does that mean for the fan? And the truth is, it varies for, for every fan what that expectation looks like. It looks different for the fan that's live and in person at the game. It's different for the fan that is at home or, or watching from a bar. It's different for the fan that enjoys tailgating than the fan that spends time eating in the suite. And maybe that's the same person. So how do we figure out how to, how to identify, how to reach, how to communicate with these fans in the ways that matter most to them. And the solution to that globally is personalization at scale. I mean, this is something that we've talked about for years. Um, it's applicable across industries. We're going to spend time today, this morning, diving into more detail of what that means for sports and live events. But it's always helpful, I find, to see some statistics and, and some um, proof of concept learnings from other industries. And, you could see that you're not alone if you're spending time on personalization at scale. Um, about 90% of digital businesses are investing in it. We also know that, um, and this is great news, that consumers, fans are willing to provide their data in exchange for a more personalized experience. So really strong statistic there. And then in terms of ROI, I mean, we're definitely seeing the increase in revenue. You can see um, around $20 return for every dollar spent. That's, that's pretty compelling. And then also cost savings uh, with, with reducing customer acquisition costs by 50%. And, and by the way, acquisition costs are getting higher and higher. So I'm definitely a fan of, of retention, although we do have to keep an eye on those younger generations for, for, for sure, which we'll also touch on. And personalization at scale can be framed a bunch of different ways. Uh, at Adobe, we, we establish these pillars. Um, I'm going to focus most on the first pillar, which is data and insights. So before you can do anything, you really have to break down organizational silos, get your data centralized, um, get it in a format that is certainly actionable. Uh, you want to analyze your data, make the most of it. I mean, this is, this is really the foundation. But also, there's, there's tremendous opportunity, especially in sports and live entertainment, around this content and collaboration second pillar, or content velocity, content creation and distribution, whatever you want to call it. I mean, we have the best content out of all industries. I mean, we need to take that content. We need to make sure we're maximizing short form content, especially, again, as I mentioned, those younger generations and, and fans, the younger fans are not sitting down and watching a three hour game. I mean, they're, they're not sitting through the whole thing. They wanna see clips from their favorite players. They wanna see only the moments that matter to them. So, so we need to be able to spin that up and as close to real time as possible. 
And then finally, there's that journey piece, which, again, is something we've talked about for a long time. What does a fan journey look like? Um, I think there's a lot of uh, great vision for the fan journey, and we'll go through what that can look like specifically for a sports example. But before we're able to activate on that journey, we really need to, to focus on that core foundation, and, and that's data. So I will make the assertion that data powers personalization without data. I mean, how do you personalize? How do you deliver the experience that you're trying to deliver to each fan without knowing more about them, knowing what makes them take action, what motivates them? So there's good news here. Fans want personalization, and they are willing to provide their data. We conducted a short test at Adobe, so this is um, these are our results and what we heard specifically from sports fans. And 67% uh, of fans feel like promotional emails are not um, targeted towards them or personalized for them. Um, that said, 79% of fans are willing to take a quiz to receive more personal, personalized recommendations. So this is very similar to the stat I shared earlier from, I think it was Accenture, that said a little over 80% of customers are willing to provide their data in exchange for more personalized experiences. So some good consistency there. And then when we look at Gen Z, uh, those fans would definitely be motivated to opt into um, downloading mobile apps, which we specifically ask them about in exchange for special offers. I mean, it's a price sensitive group right now, so they want to have um, those offers available to them. So, so all really good information that fans are, are willing to engage with us. So with all that, I get asked by our clients, our prospects all the time, like, this is great. We believe in personalization at scale. We believe in data. Um, where do we start? Uh, what data is useful? How do I get it? How do I get it without annoying my fans? How do I uh, put it to good use for results? So, so with that, let's, let's break down what data is most meaningful. And I think we're all bombarded by data. There's a lot to look at. Um, and it really is all valuable in its own way. But I think there's definitely a theme in recent years around our cookie-less future. And we can agree that we can't rely so much on third-party data from various sources. And we need to be more in control of the data that we have on our fans so we can activate on that in um, a responsible way, especially as uh, privacy legislation continues to evolve. Uh, second, second party data is also really interesting and we're making some good progress there. In fact, we do have some offerings around um, bringing brands together. So when you think of maybe sponsors at sports properties and how you can uh, bring brands together to share first party data in a very controlled, uh, safe, reliable environment. So that's something that we can keep an eye on for the future. But Given our limited amount of time together this morning, I'm going to focus a little bit on first party data, but more on zero party data. So first party data, again, really important. There's a lot of slicing and dicing, analyzing, modeling uh, you can do on that data. So I am not dismissing it by any means. It's, it's really important. Uh, first party data, I think there's a lot of past purchase activity. You're tracking where fans are going on websites, um, things of, those nature, of that nature, and I think first-party data does a really good job of telling you where your fans have been, but it doesn't necessarily tell you where your fans are going. You can infer, and that's where the modeling and the algorithms and, and AI and ML come in, but what is an even more um, reliable source of telling you where fans are going are the fans themselves, and, and that's where, where zero-party data comes in. So, um, so zero-party data, it, it's the gold, it's the MVP for the marketer. Um, it's something, it, it's data that, uh, that's shared intentionally by fans, by customers, telling you their preferences, telling you their wants. Um, and I think uh, it was Forrester that coined the term a few years ago, um, if you want to research that more. But what I really love about zero-party data is that, on one hand, fans are saying, they want privacy. I mean, they're really being tight about the data that they share um, or the data that is being tracked on them. On the other hand, fans are saying, customers, consumers are saying that they want 
uh, more personalized experiences. So how do you bring the two together in a responsible way? And that's zero party data because it's a very transparent, explicit exchange of information and there's ways to set that up so fans have a, a positive experience and then brands, sports organizations can in turn use that data in a meaningful way to achieve their goals and, um, and change those fan experiences. So, so where do I start? And, and I always say, you, you wanna start with, with the end in mind. So what are your business objectives? What are your fan priorities? And, and you could start really with either one of these. Um, I will go through business objectives and I just put up here for the, the purpose of illustration some common business objectives that I've seen from sports and live entertainment organizations over the years, driving more revenue through ticket sales and sponsorship, increasing per caps and venue, increasing engagement and loyalty, driving more streaming. There's a big movement towards the at-home fan and how do you capture them, better engage with them via their second screen, so a lot going on there. And it's really important when you look at your business objectives to think how do they marry up with fan priorities, and we try to do that as much as possible. So you can see I uh, listed some fan priorities below, and, and they do pretty much align with the business objectives above them, but you wanna make sure you're always keeping that, that fan first mentality throughout. And then while I said you can't have journeys, the, the fan journeys that, that we all wanna have without data, it doesn't mean you can't vision them and you can't think about what they ideally will look like. And this will help, help you ultimately map out what data you need. So again, a, an example fan journey up, up on the screen there. You can see a few things at the beginning and the end, a targeted ticketing offer and a personalized streaming offer. It's hard to, to target if you don't know about those individual fans and um, that's, that ticket offer is going to vary for me than it is for, for my friend or, or my dad or my mom or sister. So, um, so this is where the data informs the situation. You'll also see things like uh, downloading the app is an action we want the fan to take. Maybe engaging in more in-seat ordering. In-seat ordering's been around for a really long time. That doesn't mean it's been well adopted and we need to make sure that fans are aware of what's available to them and we encourage that through the fan journey. Fans are planning more now than ever before they show up for live events, so let's take advantage of that and weave that into the desired fan journey. That's not only going to increase per caps, which was one of our objectives, but ideally provide a, a better experience for the fan while they're in venue in this case. So, so again, a little bit more of, of where do I start? There's a lot of tactics that you can use for zero party data collection, many of which you've been using for, for a lot of years and they just need to be revisited. So preference centers, for instance, we've all set them up over the years, but a lot of times it's set it and forget it. And it's time to revisit those preference centers, humanize them a little bit, um, add a little, a little bit of personality to them, refresh the questions, make sure fans understand what they're opting into, uh, favorite team, favorite player. I mean, these are, these are common, easy questions to start with. Same thing for welcome and re-engagement campaigns. A lot of times there's a, a one-touch welcome program, set it and forget it and done. But these things should be dynamic as fan preferences change over time and there's opportunities to collect this information on an ongoing basis. I've seen really good uses of quizzes and surveys, what kind of fan are you? Uh, a lot of sports properties use Jebit, which is why I listed them up here, and they're also a partner of ours and, and feed our systems, but they have some really great immersive experiences that they use to help capture this fan data. And then, of course, uh, progressive profiling is, a, is another common tactic that we see. But the sooner you engage with these fans, the, the better job you'll do at promoting these long-term relationships and increasing lifetime value. And when you think about the questions you ask, you have to think about the value exchange because fans, uh, this is always in, in mind for fans and consumers, what are they going to get in exchange for their time, in exchange for their information? That has to be really clear. and. And 
what we've heard from our partners is that giving fans a recommendation is actually something that they really value. So, so that's something they're willing to give up information for to learn more about what they can watch, what they can get, what, how they can better improve their experience as a fan. They certainly also want to be entertained. They want to save money. They want to save time. They want to learn. They want to be quizzed. So, so there's lots of different things to look at and also test because one fan might respond better and provide more information in exchange for a gift card where another fan will simply want access to something or, or to know um, where they stack against uh, other fans in the larger population pool. So, so this, this definitely varies and this is where it becomes really important to have technology in place too that can, um, that can ingest and activate on all this very specific fan information. And don't underestimate team performance or the mo moments that matter. When a team is winning, when they're going to playoffs, when they're going to the Super Bowl, I mean, fans are so jazzed, they're much more willing to provide information during these times and maybe when the team's not doing so well or just in the middle of the season when nothing exciting is happening. So when we have these big events, these big moments to draft, make sure you capitalize on that as a, as a good anchoring opportunity to better converse with your fans. So what we have here is just a in the wild example from the NBA that I actually shared a while ago. But but what I did want to share was some results. So you can see that from these immersive zero-party data capture experiences, we're seeing really high engagement rate and really high completion rate. So, so that's good news. And then when it comes to lead capture, this is where we um, are referring to durable identifiers being captured, so like email address. And when you ask for this type of information, sometimes you see drop-offs. And this is where you want to look at your data and, and where the testing comes in. And I do always like to share examples from other industries that I think are doing a good job at this. Stitch Fix is, is one that I use, and I think they do a great job. Any Stitch Fix users? Yes, yes, looking good. <laughs> um, so Stitch Fix, I mean, the value exchange is really clear because as a customer, if you don't tell Stitch Fix, the types of uh, clothing you're interested in, your size, your style, then you're not gonna get things in the mail that you ultimately want or, or that you're looking for. So really clear value exchange. You could see uh, there's tons of examples. I mean, in the beauty industry, uh, Pinterest, when you sign up, they collect your, your preferences and interests to, to feed your homepage. But you could, you could go on and on, but I always like to surface a few from other industries. And then when we think about this content that's captured across web-based properties, you want to make sure that you're feeding it somewhere. Uh, and, and you could feed it a lot of places, but I'm really big on, on real-time CDPs right now as we think about ways that we can better centralize uh, the, the view of the fan and also have it actionable, all that data actionable in real time. So what this could look like is a fan can be filling out a quiz and they could be asked their favorite team, and then on the next click, without even collecting their email or any durable identifier, you can take them to their favorite team's homepage or merch page or whatever it is. Super basic example, but, but this is real time, next click stuff, and that's where it gets really powerful, and the fan sees the benefit of having that digital dialogue with the, with the sports property. All right, so hopefully you've noticed some themes throughout the, the discussion so far. There's a lot around data and analytics, but then there's a lot of importance around creativity, and this is where the art and science of data come together. So we all think of the, the left brain as analytical, a little bit more black and white, and, and the right side of the brain is, is a little bit more creative and, and passionate and, and thinks in color. Um, who in this room is more of a left brain? I think there's gonna be a lot. Okay, all right, yeah, as expected. And, and right brain, anybody? Okay, a few. Both? Fellow Geminis? Because you guys really get it. We get it. <laughs> Geminis? Okay. All right. So um, when, you, when you look around, when you think through history, I mean, there's so many great quotes on the importance of art and science from Leonardo da Vinci, from Albert Einstein. One of my favorite quotes is actually from a, a lesser known American journalist who says, and I want to make sure I get it right, the art and science of asking good questions is the source of all knowledge. So 
tying things back to our discussion, asking good questions. I mean, that's the source of all knowledge. So I think as we all spend an increasing amount of time on looking at data, centralizing it, normalizing it, making sure it's actionable, modeling off of it, uh, that's all really important, but we also wanna make sure we zoom out and we get creative and we think from a fan perspective, because I'm pretty sure we're all, fa we're all fans, and that we ask questions of our fans, we ask good questions of our fans that are able to inform personalization at scale and inform our success as a fan-first organization. So uh, to recap on, on some of the steps real quickly and get it all on the screen for you who wanna capture it, First and foremost, be clear on the ultimate actions or the end goal you want your fans to take, and then map data points back to each of these actions. So if you're asking fans questions, you wanna make sure that you can put them to good use or they're just facilitating that natural human digital dialogue that you're having, but, but don't ask questions, don't collect data that you're not using because it's, it's gonna be an opportunity cost for something else. And also keep in mind fan life cycles. I mean, you're going to talk to uh, a new casual fan differently than you are a longtime season seat holder or an in-person fan differently than an at-home fan. So, so always, always keep those factors in mind. Audit the data you have. Sometimes you have this information already, so, so that's great. Let's maximize that. And always have a plan for activating the data once you have it. I think you definitely want to start collecting the data as soon as possible, but you don't want to have all this data and then, okay, what do you do with it? So this is where you really have to think about your technology, data flow, and, and how you're going to ultimately deliver these personalized experiences back to fans powered by data. Remember that value exchange is, is really key and this is where I think when, I, I see a lot of surveys out there and, and from sports properties and sometimes they're, they're clunky and sometimes they're, um, they're just not natural and I think that sometimes we forget that we can actually reverse the binoculars and, and be the fan and, and, and take these surveys and, and think of things from the fan perspective. So, so I can't encourage that enough. Add personality, that makes everything a little bit more enjoyable and, and natural. And we didn't talk a lot about this, but you wanna be mindful of cadence. I mean, that also varies by fan. Some fans have a higher tolerance than others, I think when fans are showing that they respond to a certain type of tactic or they're engaging with quizzes, give them more quizzes. Um, and, and this is something that you can test as well, cadence when they visit the website or, or the emails. And, and this is where you also wanna have that technology in place that can track the individual preferences of each fan because this isn't a, a one time, okay, for every fan we're gonna ask this question at this cadence. I mean, it's going to vary. So, so this is another component where you wanna test and you wanna have the technology to back it up. And definitely maximize what's working and, and make adjustments along the way. And, and this is where reporting and analytics is really important. You wanna know what your fans are responding to. You wanna know the data that you're collecting from fans, how it's being used, and if it's generating revenue, if it's generating action, if it's uh, doing what you intended it to do. So always come full circle, look at, look at the results, and, um, and keep building from there. So, uh, so with that, I, I'll, I'll leave you with my email address. I will. I do have a, a little bit of time for questions. Um, I'm working on just a, a one-sheeter kind of worksheet that, that summarizes a lot of the content that I shared today that's actionable, so feel free to drop me a line if you want a copy of that. And thanks again for being here. I'll take questions now. Hi, thank you for taking the time, first of all. Um, I was wondering if throughout your data study and your experiences with multiple organizations, if you found like differences in the fan willingness to share data based on the organization or the league? Yeah, um, certainly. I mean, fan avidity can vary. Um, it can vary not only by league, it could vary by team and, and even team performance, like, like I mentioned. So. I think that's something to recognize and just get creative with. And I think um, maybe you need to offer uh, a higher value exchange for certain questions when the avidity, <clears throat> avidity isn't there. Um, but I think 
more globally, like I mentioned earlier, being in sports and live entertainment, we're at such an advantage over other industries because our fans, our, our customers, our patrons, are, they are so passionate and they really do want to have that next level of interaction with, with their favorite sport or favorite team or favorite player um, is, is really a big one, is player avidity that, that we're seeing. So, um, so I think that you know, that's definitely all in our favor. Thank you. Hey, Jen. Uh, my name is Stanton Fields. Uh, my question is, can you give an example about how a team or league goes about determining whether fan, um, whether they like um, what they want, whether it's like recommendations or to be taught something or, you know, to be tested, like different ways that how they go about doing that? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, there's a few ways and some of it you just said, it's, it's testing. Um, I think you can start with, um, what we know works you know, overall and what we've seen really good response rates from. And then this is where some of the other uh, first party data, where um, what type of fan we know um, they are. So if they are a casual fan, they may respond differently and we might need to be more aggressive with the value exchange versus uh, a more um, long-term devoted fan. They, uh, they may be willing to engage in different ways. So I think this, this is a perfect example of where um, the art and science do come together, looking for any sort of baseline data that you have on the fan, what's worked, uh, and then starting to, to A-B test, but then capture results, not only globally, so, so what works across the entire set, but, but start to be able to capture at the technology level what each fan is, is, um, is responding to. And that's where you start to fine tune the, the types of offers, the types of value exchange that, that each fan um, you know, might uh, respond best to or what resonates with them, whether it is that discount, uh, which may be um, uh, work better for the more price sensitive groups, you know, Gen Z, the younger populations, versus some of the, uh, the gamers who just want to test their knowledge and, and kind of compete and they're just constantly looking for ways to, to engage in that way versus somebody who wants access to information. So, um, so I think, yeah, you, know, you want to, you always want to consider what you're asking, um, the, the data you have on the fan and, and test. All right, I think we're up on time, but thank you very much, Jen, and thank you all for attending.